When did that boulder start rolling downhill? I guess the day, the defining moment when the idea, I guess, popped into my head. Um, 640 Labs, it was 2014. We were out fundraising, you know, uh, Corbett and I and a couple, we call them fa- uh, what, uh, friends, families, and fools decided yep. to invest yep. in 640 Labs. And and 2014, we were we were going out fundraising. We were data, you know, data analytics in agriculture, and you know, we weren't having a lot of luck getting funding. Yep. And you know, if you've ever talked with VCs, it's it's like asking a girl out on a date. They won't really tell you why. <laughs> They'll just say no. Yep. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. Yep. Um, we all know that. Yep. <laughs> right. I have yeah. some experience with that. Yeah, yeah. They used to call me. Uh, I don't think Sawyer gets told no very much. Yeah. Uh, he's the taller, better looking version of his family. Uh, what one farmer say? They used to call me bedspread. I've been turned down so many times. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That's pretty good. That's yeah. good right there. Uh, That's a bomb. All of the food we eat and much of the clothing we wear comes from plants and animals that are raised on farms. Farms are different in type in size, and even in name. Welcome to Barn Talk. What happens at the barn stays at the barn until now. We're going to let it all out for you guys. Today is a really special episode. Today, uh, we're going to go over our two favorite topics. As you guys know, we like talking about tech, and we also like to talk about farming. And so we're going to have a really deep dive on this one, and uh, we're going to explore the questions. Does farm, uh, does farm equipment continue to get bigger, larger, and larger, or is it going to get eventually smaller? What happens when we can't find enough labor? Does the size and efficiency really go hand in hand? And... We'll explore more questions further than that, but I'm here with my co-host, sidekick, Torque and Moore. Torque. Yeah, I like Torque and Moore. I should get like a hat that says Torque and Moore on it. Um, yeah, this is this kind of came together. We've been working on this for a while, and I just have to say that uh, I'm I'm seriously I'm seriously stoked for this. Uh, it it's going to be it's it's a subject that's near and dear to my heart, but. Um, <laughs> Before we get going, I'll give you I'll give you a little update on where we are in southeast Iowa. So a few people have actually started harvest. Um, there's a, a pioneer plot in right north of Washington that came out yesterday. I thought maybe I could get all the info out of it, but they don't have it all compiled yet. But the corn's good. Everybody that I know this way, corn the yields are pretty good. Um, I don't think you have to go very far south and they start trailing off because they they were pretty dry and they missed some rains that we got but um it looks like it's going to be good and drying rapidly um i talked to a couple guys yesterday that were running and their corn's running 21 percent right now and um we were gonna start this week but i went out and hand shelled some and it was still like 25 but that was on wednesday and i think by the time we get through the weekend we're going to start monday Mm -hmm. uh because we're btos and we got a lot to do so we got to get after it (laughs) yeah don't want to be picking in the snow (laughs) um a lot of the beans are shedding off i got a neighbor that's got some early group two beans and they're shedding off hard um so it's all going to come at once um markets so this is the thursday close and it i looked a little bit looked like things were down a little bit today everybody's worried about exports so um, they're going to run it down a little bit but corn locally 565 is the best bid and and that's gonna that's only going to last a few days because once these hog feeders start getting a few trucks coming they're going to drop it like a hammer but right now there's some pretty good local bids Um, 565 i think that's better than anything you can get anywhere else um soybeans 1264 and cedar rapids if you want to go to cargill and sit in line and hope that they don't break down and 1299 if you want to go across the river to quincy uh wheat 713 i brought wheat in i i brought the wheat back i (laughs) i don't know i I, like the change up keeps things interesting yeah well it doesn't change much i think it was 713 the last time we had it in there well there's no change in the price you just got to take them out and then throw them back in yeah that's true there you go that's That's a little change keep it keep Keep it it spicy keep it fresh um hogs 85 dollars 
cattle. I should have taken cattle out, but I'm not going to. 123. It's actually down a little bit because it's been 124, 125. Bitcoin's 47,000. I thought I thought we were going to have a strong recovery. It's it went it went down through this week and then came back hard and I thought it was going to get back to 50, but it didn't make it. Tesla 757. It goes down every morning and then it works its way back through the afternoon. So I don't know. Thousand dollar Tesla by the end of the year? Questionable. I I'm it's holding coming. out hope. That's yeah. why I'm a farmer. I keep hoping. So um today we're gonna ask if you guys get any value from the show, just share it out with your friends, share it out with your family, share it out with your coworkers, whoever. That's the kind of the ticket to admission for watching or listening to the show. Um, we don't run that. We don't run ads on the show. We also don't run ads to promote the show. It's just kind of all organic growth. So that's all we ask. Leave us a review, leave us a rating on Apple podcast, Spotify, and that just, you know, helps us push us out to more people. We're trying to bring, do some good in this world. So that's all we ask from you guys. Okay. So without further ado, today we got a guy that really is on the bleeding edge of ag autonomy. And I couldn't have put together a set of questions that uses the word autonomy more than what I've got in this. So if I screw it up a few times, that's a lot of syllables for me to get out <laughs> for some reason. But um, so the company that he founded, they they were the first to plant an entire field fully autonomously, and the platform that they're running has provided uh, has run multiple systems continuously for like forty eight hours straight, which that's pretty impressive. Um, he's an Iowa native, graduated from ISU with a degree in electrical engineering, and then he got his master's from Illinois Institute of Technology. Um, he's worked with a broad group of companies. So when I, when, I, when I looked at his LinkedIn profile, I was looking through all these companies, and I was like, yep, yep, and, and making a note. And then there's, there's a, at the bottom it says, see more. Well, then when you hit see more, there's like, Another list of companies. I was like, holy cow. So he has worked for some of the biggest. I mean, it's pretty impressive. Um, he's worked from John Deere to Motorola to the Climate Corp. And then he's also started six companies of his own. Um, and that's that's not all of it. Um, today, he is the CEO of Sabanto. And that's an autonomous ag startup. And any of you that are familiar with the videos of the cabless Kubota tractors that are planting or tilling or seeding. Um, they are the company behind that. Um, check it out on LinkedIn, Twitter, Twitter. Um, it's pretty impressive. Um, we're, we're batting way above our IQ level with this guy. So hopefully he takes pity on us and, <laughs> and doesn't use his full arsenal, of big words. Um, his, so his CB handle is cat daddy. And among all of his accomplishments, he also uh, has wild wild boar wrestling on his on his list of abilities. So, Craig Rupp, welcome to Barn Talk. Welcome to Barn Talk. All right, thank you, uh, Torek and Sawyer, for uh, inviting me, and uh, I'm happy to be here. Okay, well, we're gonna we're gonna get right into we're it. We're gonna get into it. Just give us some background of growing up in Iowa as a you know farm farm kid and your journey of how you kind of went to start Sabano and uh, just all the companies work for, you know, what was your childhood like? What goals did you have? What led you to go into engineering? Okay. So I grew up in Northwest Iowa, Cherokee, Iowa, uh, on a farm, uh, corn, soybeans, hogs, cattle. Um, and, uh, you know, when I, when I was young, my dad would have these box radios on his tractor and, you know, lo and behold, uh, they would break down and he would get rid of them and he would buy another one on a farm sale and he would always give them to me. And, you know, I had this wild ideas that, you know, I'm going to go in and start, uh, you know, uh, communicating with aliens, communicating with aliens <laughs> or, uh, actually fixing these, you know, and I, I guess, uh, Rupp repair turned into Rupp salvage and, and I just got an old soldering iron and, you yep. know, a plumber's soldering iron and, and, and took parts off and would collect them. And I had no idea what they were. And, um, so it just so happened in Cherokee, there was this little shop, it was a bike shop that happened to be a radio shack. 
Sure. And, and my friends and I would always go down there and look at these bicycles knowing, you know, that there's just no way in hell this thing would, you know, these bikes would ever see, you know, our farm. Right. And my dad always picked up bikes on farm sales. Okay. Um, and then while I was in there, I just, I happened to notice the Radio Shack portion of the business and I started seeing these little components and I'm like, my God, these look familiar. These yep. are the same things. And it just so happens that they had, uh, you know, these little workbooks or these, these manuals, these, these, you know, you could learn electronics yep. at Radio Shack. And it was my version of the internet. Sure. And I started reading through them. I was, it was kind of interested, you know, as to how this, works. how all these parts work. Exactly. And, uh, and then meanwhile, when I was, uh, uh, you know, when I was a kid, this is probably before your time, mm-hmm. but there used to be television repair people that used to come out all oh, the yeah. time, you know, because they had vacuum tubes right. and, and this guy would walk in with, you know, you know, uh, you know, big old a, bag or a big toolbox. old bag toolbox of vacuum tubes. And, and then he had his tools and mm-hmm. these are tools that I'd never seen before. <laughs> yep. yeah. You know, these, these were not tools you fix fences with. Right. These were, you know, little pliers and, and, and I just, I, I was just intrigued. Yep. At that, and then uh, I decided that I'm going to get into, um, I'm going to be become uh, um, do something with electronics and, and and electricity. Awesome. Yep. So you always had a curious mind, always curious about that kind of stuff. So you always felt like it was an it was just in you to be that way. Yeah, and when I graduated, um, so I was told my brother I was a spare, not the heir. <laughs> and so my brother still farms, and I, uh, you know, I think my father, uh, you know, breathed a sigh of relief when I decided that. Yeah, I'm going to leave the farm, Dad. I, <laughs> yep. I've had enough of that, of agriculture, and I, you know, in 1984, I never thought I would set foot again on a farm. So you, so you graduate. What what made you decide to go to Iowa State? You know, it was kind of funny. I, I was your typical 18-year-old. I, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. But I wanted to, you know, at the time, I wanted to be a technician. And because I had no no idea what an engineer and tech yep. difference between them. And so I applied uh, to numerous colleges. Uh, to be, you know, they, they had an electronic technician degree. And, uh, you know, I was looking at the price. I'm like, oh, my God, this is expensive. Yep. And then, you know, obviously the first thing that went through my mind is, uh, you know, I wonder, I go to state school, right? Mm-hmm. So um, um, I did call University of Iowa, and I remember I talked to them and asked them, you know, uh, do you have a technician degree? And, and they just said, call Iowa State. And so I called Iowa State. <laughs> wow. I, and, and, and it was, and this lady answered the phone and, you know, she paused for like five seconds. She says, well, what are you interested in? I'm like electronics and electricity. And she's like, well, do you know what an engineer is? And I, you know, I <laughs> no idea. Right? No, I've never met one. Right. I have no idea, you know, what, what an engineer is, the difference yeah. between them. And she probably spent 20 minutes on the phone with me. Explaining. explaining. You listen in Iowa, you messed up here. You messed up. You got to be, you got to be better with the people when they call. No, you, but. No, no, you, you know, you know, <laughs> trust <laughs> me, you know, as an 18 year old, you know, it's funny, you, you know, they, they get, um, uh, what's the term that they, they get, uh, advice from the oddest sources, right? You know, yep. I, I, I remember, um, you know, growing up, you know, I, I'd never been around anyone who went to college other than the veterinarian. He would come out yeah, mm-hmm. and he would tell my dad these wild stories about college. <laughs> and I remember as a kid, he was talking about how, you know, he and his buddies rented a house yeah. and, you know, I'm, I'm eight, nine years old. I'm you just, were fascinated. I'm like, I could not believe <laughs> renting a house with, you know, Jay, Brad and Neil. Yeah. I mean, we could eat Oreos all day long. <laughs> Mom's not around. I'm serious. <laughs> no, I totally what get it. What were you I more totally intrigued in? Were you more intrigued by the electronics or when you heard those stories, you're like, ah, oh, I got to go. I got to get, I got to get over there. I got to get to state college. <laughs> it was, it was a little of each, <laughs> yeah. but I, I do remember that it was a defining moment. Yeah, as, that's awesome. You yeah. know, and this, you know, he was talking about, you know, that, you know, debauchery and I'm like, yeah, yeah. Oreos, <laughs> <laughs> you know, mom's not going to yell at you. Oh my God. I, the things I could do. Freedom. College is such a, it's such an interesting thing because it's a melting pot. You meet so many people from different, um, we had a guy on uh podcast last week and he was talking about how, um, 
his his kind of his lifelong friends or people he met in college versus high school because in high school you have common and you have extracurriculars. Yeah, it's all extracurricular that you make connections because you're all in football or you're all in this or you're all in that. But when you get to college, you meet people that have similar passions that you have, and that connection is stronger right. than... Just, um, I didn't have that because I went to Kirkwood, and the only passion was drinking beer out of a funnel. But <laughs> that we aren't here to talk about that. I've been to Kirkwood and <laughs> drank beer out of a funnel. <laughs> So, <laughs> and and I, it's cherished my cherished memories as far as that goes, but <laughs> maybe not the best use of my funds. I'll just say <laughs> that. But anyway, so um, so you started Iowa State, yes. And what did you, as you progress through there, did you get uh, an idea of like what you wanted your focus to be? Yes. As soon as you as soon as she uh, like recommended being an engineer, were you like, yep? I'm an engineer and I'm just going to stick with that. And, or did you just like first class you took, you loved it. And you're like, yeah, this is it. This is what I want. Well, you got to um, get all that gen ed out yeah. of the way. Gen yeah. Ed. Right. Yeah. Right. You know, um, you know, at the time, uh, well, I think it still is. Well, it, actually any engineering, uh, you know, they would all put us in a room mm-hmm. and you know, th- th- these were incoming freshmen and you know, I completely felt out of place. Sure. Cause I'm looking around and, I mean, th- these guys are nerds, <laughs> <laughs> and they look really, really smart. Yep. And you know, I'm, you know, I'm, I was kind of wild. Yep. <laughs> you know, I was the youngest in the family. Yep. And uh, I think my two sisters and brothers would say yep. that I was the wildest of the four. And um, uh, you know, they always say, you know, I don't take responsibility, and I'm like, well, you uh, guys, this sounds familiar. You guys took it all. There's none left for me. Right. So. Um, but they, they put us all in a room and, and, you know, I'm looking around, I'm like, oh my God, am I out of place? Um, and then they, you know, you know, they tell you, you know, meet the people sitting next to you. And then they tell you next year, one of those people will be gone. Sure. Because they're going to, they're going to fail. They're going to wash out. They're going to wash out. And, uh, you know, I'm looking around and, you know, scared straight. I'm like, what in the hell did I just get myself into? Sure. And, uh, but then I thought, you know, um, you know, they may be smarter than me, but I'll work harder. Mm-hmm. I can work harder than them. Yep. Kind of that farm Iowa background. It was, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I mentioned earlier, my dad, uh, you know, he always, you know, the harder he works, the luckier he gets. Yep, yep. He instilled that work ethic in you. But I decided uh, while I was in there that I'm going to go into communications and wireless in particular. And, and I, that would have been fairly brand new that was an evolving technology um it was i mean at the time you know uh you know at the time you know a lot of a lot of communications were were analog am fm yep. and and you know you just started seeing the uh the evolution of uh, digital digital yep. communication standards and, mm-hmm. and and the technology evolving so you graduate you graduate with your degree yep and then you decide so was it a did you know when you graduated that you wanted to go on and get your master's right away or did that what was that thought process um i i was pretty tired of school yeah mm-hmm. and uh i wanted to get into uh rf and i went to uh chicago and went to work for motorola okay and while i was there it was kind of interesting at motorola that um you get you get you get to get your master's for free they pay for it. They pay for it. Yeah. And at internally in Motorola, um, there's two ladders. There's a management ladder and there's a technical ladder. And I wanted to go up the technical ladder. And if you did not have your uh, masters, you weren't didn't have very many rungs on the ladder. Yeah. And on the on the management ladder, if you didn't have your MBA, then yep. you're, you were stuck. You're stuck. You're you're never gonna be a VP. You're never right. gonna be a principal engineer. Uh, so I was, uh, and it's free, so, you know. Yeah. I'd take 12 classes, and, and it was literally. <laughs> check the box. Check the boxes, yeah. What year would have that been? So you get your master's, and you're at Motorola. How long did you stay there? Um, I stayed there until 95. I started on GSM, the first digital cellular okay. um, system. It was a European standard, but then 
you know, migrated over to the U.S. Wonderful standard. Those Europeans are really good at writing specifications. Okay. Um, especially in the in the wireless industry. And then I uh, then I transferred over to Iridium. So I know Satcom. Yeah. So Iridium, their project was. Um, I I feel like I know this because. So that was the original like satellite phone. Is that right? Yeah, um, you know, there were other ones out there, you know, but they were, they, they were, uh, you know, it was a satellite mobile phone. There were systems yeah. out there like Inmarsat and, um, but they were briefcase sized yeah. phones. Okay. So the, yeah. the only reason I know anything about that is because the guy that I worked for, uh, went on a safari to Africa Yeah, absolutely. and he was, um, he was the company that I worked for. In other words, he had to have his hand on everything, and he was he was paranoid about anything going wrong. But anyway, he paid, I don't know what he paid, but it was an, a sizable sum so that while he was on safari, once a day at a certain time, he had this satellite phone, and he could call, and he called, and I don't know how long, I don't know how long it, lasted but it was a limited amount of time that he had signal yeah <laughs> and so he mm-hmm. called he called every single person <laughs> to get an update as to what was going on yeah i don't think that was it it wasn't iridium it wasn't iridium okay that was, okay. That was one of the the benefits of iridium it was a later yeah low earth orbiting okay um you know what initially there were 77 satellites but then they they through optimization they brought that number down to 66 okay so you were there through 95 okay okay <laughs> well because i know <laughs> that those were some wild times actually i bet they were they absolutely were the group i worked with they were um they were a bunch of renegade um, out of control engineers. Well, and it, it was something else. But it it was like the wild, wild west, and the fact that you were like you were inventing the technology, weren't you? Basically, we were absolutely. And it was funny because I mean, it was kind of a how, how do I say it? Um, it? It was it was kind of a high risk career wise to go to Iridium, and it was interesting about the people that I met there. And you mentioned earlier about keeping tabs on them. Yeah. I mean, there there were, you know, there were fifty to a hundred of us engineers, and I mean, they're they're some of the closest friends I keep in contact now yeah. with. Um, matter of fact, Six Forty Labs, one of the engineers I I co-founded that company with, he was uh, I worked with him at Motor at Radium. Sure. And and you know, I I could, just a list of all the guys, and you know, I I. Uh, you know, one of the guys that at Sabanto is one of the engineer's sons yep. that I had a smoked a cigar when he was born. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's it's a very close knit group of us. Well, I feel like when you get a group of people together that are singular, singularly yeah. focused, yeah, and share a passion. That bond, like that's a bond. That's a you know there there's jobs. And then there's experiences, and yeah. that was like an that was an experience that you all had. That when you talk to somebody else, people are like, oh yeah, that's neat. But when you talk, like when you're with those people, you know you know what that feeling was like. Absolutely, yeah, and absolutely. It, These guys are, um, you know, matter of fact. I mean, you know, in my GSM days or my National Instruments days or my uh, Deer days. Um, We all get together, you know, every two years, uh, have a barbecue, and uh, uh, just an absolute great group of guys. Was that your favorite company you worked for? You know, in terms of, uh, you know, Iridium was by far the... the, Most fun. uh, The most fun. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Um, You know, National Instruments was, uh, uh, that company was an amazing company. It was the most entrepreneurial large company I've ever worked for. Mm-hmm. And they would let me do anything I want, yeah. and and myself and another guy out of Wales, he and I would we would we were all over the world. We were in China, Singapore, Israel, uh, all throughout Europe, all throughout the U.S. and South America, and 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 they we were developing technology, and uh, 
It was very entrepreneurial. And they just let you go. Yeah. Wherever I mean, it took you. Was, yeah, I spent nine years there. Yeah. And, you know, and had had you know, had it not been there, I probably would have spent, you know, four. Right. You bring up an interesting point because it's it's kind of ironic. So yesterday I just was listening to a little bit of a podcast that Lex Freeman was on or Friedman was yeah. on. And he was he was on there about something else, but he was talking about he had he has had in the past a very tight relationship with Boston Dynamics, mm-hmm. and he's very into autonomous robots, basically. Mm-hmm. But he said that he's kind of parted ways with them. Um, I didn't get an I didn't get a sense as to whether like completely or whether he just doesn't do much with them. And he said the reason for that is that when they sold, that company sold to Hyundai. And he said when earlier, the engineers, the people that were doing the work, they had complete free reign as to what they wanted to explore and what they wanted to work on with these robots. And he said today... The marketing side of that business has gotten really strong and they're very, they've narrowed their, their, uh, window of research because Hyundai paid a lot of money for it and they want to monetize it. And he said he feels as though the marketing is dictating where where the research goes and where the and he doesn't like that no freedom anymore. and his really any freedom anymore. and and he and i this is a little bit biased because i know for a fact that he's very um he has very favorable impressions of elon musk and tesla and all that but he said that's one of the reasons why he thinks that say spacex and tesla has been so successful is because with elon being an engineer at heart and a researcher at heart he has done an excellent job of keeping the marketing department very underfunded and restrained as far as being able to dictate to the engineers. people actually doing the development. They don't have any rain on them. And I, I think that that is just interesting how you talked about that in that there's a, I think that's something that can really stifle innovation is when you get when you get the money involved as far as how can we how can we take this and make a dollar and it's it's a tough balancing act i mean i don't i don't take away from it because at some point all this research and everything that we're doing whatever you're, it has to pay somehow you got to pay for, somehow you have to pay for it but finding that balance i think there's a lot of companies that really struggle in having that balance yeah i uh so you know, I've I've had the honor of working for, you know, some really incredible managers. Um, you know, um, David Lodeman out of National Instruments. I remember one time he had said um, he pulled me aside and he said, "You either make the decision or I will. And if I have to, I'm going to be pissed." And then, um, and then another one at Deer when I was there, um, John Ware was his name, and. Um, and sorry for name dropping. But, no, that's fine. That's um, fine. I, I remember one time um, we were we were down in Houston, and the Starfire receivers were going to be built in Houston. And myself and another guy, we went. We were integrating with them down at Houston, um, Sugarland, right outside of uh, of Houston. And you know, we you know after we worked one day, we sat down. We were having a beer, and. Uh, you know, we, we, this was on a Thursday, um, or Wednesday night and, you know, this isn't going good. And, um, they were, you know, for one reason or another, they were being manufactured in Fargo and they wanted to move them back down to, to this Houston for this, it's more of an RF based manufacturing yeah. company. And we're like, um, you know, I know what's going to happen six months from now. Um, they're going to move manufacturing back up to Fargo. Cause it's not going to work. It's not going to work. Yeah. And, well, what do we do? And I'm like, let's go in and sit down and talk with John. And we sat down with him on Friday morning, and we said, well, um, we want to tell you something. 
You know, we think in six months you're going to be you're going to be moving this back up to Fargo. Yeah. You know, you know. Here's why: support the the you know supply, the manufacturing ability, the the personnel, blah blah. You know, just went through all the list. He said, "Okay, thank you. Let me think on think about it." You know, two hours later, he says, "All right, what do you what do you guys doing Sunday night?" <laughs> right. Yep. You're gonna you're gonna fly down to Houston. There's gonna be two semi trucks. You're gonna load all the equipment on. It's going to Fargo. We're going to take it back. Yeah. And uh, you know to have that's a good manager. It's a damn good manager. Yep. Listens know? listens to. His well, opinion. I mean that's and that's that's a tough. It's a tough position because people are relying on you, but you to have the to have the I don't know what the word is humility. Well, yeah, a lot of a, a lot, lot of, of that's, managers and bosses. I feel like they always want to. They always feel like, yeah, I'm the boss. You listen to me, and they put their thumb down on their employees. But good managers, good bosses, they understand that they work for their employees, right? Not the other way around. Yeah, and that's because you hire people that are smarter to, than you, so they can do the jobs yeah. you can't do, yeah. and you take their advice. You know, so. so you know, Steve Jobs, obviously, you know, he had said, you know, we hire smart people to tell us what to do, mm-hmm. right? But, you know, it's, it's, it's a great, you know, statement, but a lot of managers don't follow that. Right. Mm-hmm. And, I, you know, I try, I, you know, in my company, you know, I, I, you know, I'm like, Adam, this is on you. You, yep. you, you're in charge of this. Yeah. You right. know, it's your decision. Yeah. And, and I try to, you know, cause they're, they're smart people. They understand. <laughs> I think that that, I think that position's a little bit under, undervalued because, so I, I've been a manager. Um, my former role, I, I managed the the um, the fieldman for a for the company we worked for, and I really wasn't very good at it. And the reason I wasn't good at it was because um, I I wanted them. Well, I shouldn't say that. I think I was okay at it, but I could have been a lot better in the fact that I relied on my guys to take ownership. And I, I always try to instill in them that the best, the best outcome that they could come up with was one that they, that they came up with, or the best outcome we could have was one that they came up with, and they implemented it. In other words, I we had big goals as far as what we wanted to accomplish, and I I put to them, however you want to get it done, you figure out how to get it done. As long as you get it done. As long as you get it done. And that's a good that's a good way to do it. The problem that I had was, and this goes back to your Iowa kid, you know, pull up your bootstraps and get it done, is when it didn't get done, then I would jump in and I would just do it myself. And that's if you're managing very many people, you can't do that. Exactly. And um, yeah, yeah. so, and that's just one side. Then the other side of it is the guys that they want when something happens, they want to put their stamp on it that look what I did mm-hmm. when in fact they didn't, they, you know, they didn't do anything, right. yeah, but yeah, yeah. so it's, it's tough. I mean, it's tough, but one question I had for you is you, you know, you've worked for these, all these great companies. Mm-hmm. What made you want to just hop around was, you know, the, were you motivated by pay or were the companies that you first worked yeah, for short to attention take a decline? Span. I mean, what made you want to jump around and really dabble in everything a little bit? Um, okay, so let's just go through the list. Uh, when I was in GSM, I wanted to get in, into satellite communications. So Iridium was there. Mm-hmm. So that was that. And it was, it was more of a technical um, reason. Plus, another, believe it or not, when I was in GSM, I, I got this mentor. And this, this guy was just absolutely, incredibly, from a technical point of view. And I wanted to learn more from him. He moved. I moved. I followed him. Mm-hmm. Um, when I was at Motorola, uh, I decided, uh, and two of our friends, we decided that to go out and start our own company consulting. Mm-hmm. And that was probably the hardest decision I ever made, um, at that time. Uh, and, and, uh, so I went out, uh, consulting there, um, right around 2002 timeframe, um, the economy went to hell, so we just decided to go our separate ways. And my wife is from Iowa originally as well, um, high school sweetheart. And we decided that we're going to move back to Iowa. And that's how, why I took a job with John Deere. Oh, sure. Okay. And, it, you know, and again, have an egg background, you walk into deer, it helps. Yep. Right. You know, right. so thank God I grew up on a farm. 
Um, so I, I, I spent a number of years at John Deere and then, uh, I loved consulting and, and what's interesting about consulting is every day is different. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. you, you'll get a contract for three months and then, you know, so I, you know, I worked on refrigerators, on, uh, lawn mowers, on hydraulic valves for CNH, um, you know, uh, and all the wireless companies. I just absolutely loved that. And I went back consulting and then, uh, my company got acquired by national instruments. And then I went to national instruments, love that company. Um, and then, uh, you know, it, there came a point where, um, I was tired of learning about RF. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, when you go from, let's say WCDMA or UMTS to, to LTE, yeah, the modulation is different, but you know, it's the same. Just same, just different. Spectral emissions, adjacent channel coupled power, yeah, modulation accuracy, and it, it just wasn't exciting to you anymore. Oh, yeah, you I felt lo- like that you you kind of taken that as far as as it could. Yeah, I wanted. To, I, I wanted. And you're a curious guy. You yeah, grew, you know, grew up a curious guy. Yeah, and then I uh, so every year. Remember, I was talking about iridium, right? Well, a bunch of us we get together and we go oh, sure. snowmobiling up in. Up in the uh, Michigan UP. Do you have a Rupp snowmobile? Uh, no, I don't, <laughs> but I do know of Rupp snowmobiles. Gosh, you should have one. Yeah, you should have one. Rupsters. Might be a little rough yeah. ride by today's standards. Yeah, but. I think so. Um, there was a lot of debauchery up there in the UP. But uh, a friend of mine, Iridium, uh, he and I decided that we're going to start starting companies. So I started a company and I did not technically work for it. It was called Rough Riders Communications. And I, you know, all of us are satellite communications guys. And so we started a data company in the, in the, uh, in a dark uh, uh, basin down near the panhandle of Texas, bought a bunch of snowmobile trailers, put, you know, satellite dishes and we're in business and we're, we're uh, going to oil rigs. Oh, uh, sure. Yeah. And, and it was kind of a, it was kind of an interesting company because mm-hmm. I mean, it was, I mean, it was had pretty good revenues for a little company. Right. You know, it was, it was really hard to run a company, um, in Oklahoma based in, in Chicago at the time. Uh, and then I, uh, so, um, and then the other company we started was 640 labs and, um, uh, you know, I, I, uh, it took me two years to convince them, let's do something in agriculture. You know, I feel that agriculture needs, uh, needs some, some technology and wireless and, and yep. data science and data analytics. So we started 640 labs. Uh, and then, uh, and that was, yeah, basically I got tired of RF and going back into agriculture. And then, um, and then while I was, we got acquired by Climate Corporation or Monsanto. They put yep. us underneath Climate in 2014. And then um, Bear buys Monsanto, and um, you know I just did a little soul searching. And uh, you know, believe it or not, I when I left Climate, my intent was that I was going to go finish my PhD. So. I'm halfway through my PhD, so um, I, I moved back to Ames, and then uh, you know I got I kind of saw how the sausage is made in the academia world. Yep. I, you know, I was 53. I thought, well, I'll just put out the pasture. I'll just go teach, right? And I thought that would be kind of interesting to yep. to you know help the younger people. Mm-hmm. Um, but then uh, you know I, I just decided that wasn't satisfying. It wasn't satisfying enough yeah. for me, so I wanted to. I wanted to take autonomy into agriculture. So did you move a lot? So as far as, because you, you said you moved back to Iowa with your wife when you went to work for deer. Yeah. So did you drag her all over the country with yeah. you? Or did you do a lot of remote <laughs> work? Was she just supportive? She's like, well, go wherever you're going, honey. Um, so, uh, you know, my <laughs> my wife is something else. Uh, and fully supportive the whole time. That's awesome. Um, yeah, she really is. Um you know, and she's really the brains behind the unit, uh, the, but, you know, between us two, um, you know, so we were in Chicago, then we were in, in, uh, Des Moines area, then we went back to Chicago and then I did a stint in Austin as well. So, yep. um, but she, um, you know, and, I mean, right now I have two houses, 
one in. I kind of figured you did. I got the feeling that you yeah. did. And you have no idea how how bad that is. I can imagine. It's terrible. <laughs> yep. You know. Um but no, she she uh uh, she's very nomadic as well. It's bad enough. Uh, there's a lot of footage. There's a lot of comedic footage that Sawyer likes to take of any project that we do here at the farm. Okay. That uh, he likes to just shoot video of me getting mad and walking, looking for where the last place was that I left tools. Because when you have when you have four hog barns, two houses, a machine shed, a barn, couple garages, couple garages. Whatever tool you need is wherever you used it last, but be damned if I can remember where. And then we have other, you know, like he takes it. So I can't imagine what having two houses would be like because I would just all, it, every time I'd be like, oh yeah, I'm going to, damn it, I left it here or I left it there. So That's exactly what it is. And it's even <laughs> worse because like clothes, take clothes for mm-hmm. example, right? Yep. You know, I have two suits. Because I got caught in Illinois without a suit, yep. so of course I had to go out and buy one. Yep. Guess where the two suits are right Same now? Same house. No, they're in Ames. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so well, p- things migrate, yep. and then they never make it back. And then, you know, I'm going to have three suits someday. I yep. just know I will. Well, and I feel like I'd be with you in the fact that I would just have to have a, a clone set of about everything at each house. Yep. But then, yeah, you're right. It would all end up at one and... Yeah. yeah, I feel for you. Yeah. I do. So did you always feel like you wanted it almost it seems like when you talked about your path there, you've you kind of always wanted to be your own boss, start a company. Was do you love being an entrepreneur more than you loved working for somebody else? Cuz it always seemed like you jumped around, then you kind of jumped out of working for somebody, tried doing something and it worked, but then you got purchased by another company and then you just stayed there. Like what did you what do you enjoy more? being an employee or working for yourself? Um, you know, uh, well, first and foremost, it was, you know, just a couple of things. It was never about money, mm-hmm. right? So I never, I never chased it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there, I, I really, it, it's not necessarily working for myself either. Um, it, it comes down to, I want to work on something neat. Mm-hmm. When I was at yeah. Climate. Fulfilling work. Yeah, fulfilling. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, I want to do something different. I want to do something, you know, unique that nobody else has done before. Or or I want to work on technology where I'm learning. Um, you know, when I was at Climate, I, I had floated the idea to the, the suits that, hey, can I get like two, three people together and we can go automate something and... You know, internally, they're like, well, we're a data analytics company. We're not an autonomous We're this. Company. Yeah. This is our box. Yeah. This is our box. No. And, yep. you know, I'm like, oh, geez. Okay. You know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, that's how it works. Yeah. So you start Sabanto. When, when was the, when did you, when did that idea get, when did that boulder start rolling downhill? Believe it or not, um, you know, it was, um, while we were at 640, um, so let me let me tell you where the, you know the the I guess the day the defining moment when the idea uh, gets popped into my head. Um, 640 Labs. It was 2014. We were out fundraising. You know, uh, Corbett and I and a couple we call them fa- uh, what uh, friends, families, and fools decided yep. to invest. In 640 Labs, and and 2014, we were we were going out fundraising. We were data, you know, data analytics in agriculture, and you know, we weren't having a lot of luck getting funding. And you know, if you've ever talked with VCs, it's it's like asking a girl out on a date. They won't really tell you why. They'll just say no. Yep. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Um. We all know that. Yep, right. I have <laughs> yeah. some experience with that. Yeah, yeah. They used to call me. Uh, I don't think Sawyer gets told no very much. Yeah. Uh, he's the taller, better looking version of his family. Uh, would one farmer say they used to call me bedspread? I've been turned down so many times. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That's pretty good. That's yeah. good right there. Uh, That's a bomb. Uh, yeah. Um, but one VC told us that um, it's not audacious enough what you guys are doing. I see nothing interesting. Mm. And so Corbett and I are like, all right, we need to, all right, what are we going to, what are we going to do? That's audacious. 
And I'm like, well, why don't we take a ton? Let's start doing autonomy. Yep. I mean, it's really close to what we're doing because we're collecting data. Yep. We're, we're reverse engineering tractors and, and implements and combines and applicators. I'm like, you know, the next step is let's just start. We're, we'll be agriculture autonomy. And, you know, so we mold on that and then we got acquired. And so that was got always shoved to the back, shoved to the back. And it was always in the back of my mind is, you know, someone's going to do this and it's going to be really cool. And then I tried to do it at climate and, and, and then, um, 2018 came and, and I decided that I'm going to, going to step out and get it. I'm going to get started. I'm, I'm going to do it. Yeah. Okay. I'm like, uh, you know, so I'll, fall, I'll land on my feet. <laughs> Yeah, well, and you you so you have half, experience. Were you halfway through your PhD, and then you're like, you know what, screw this, because you yeah. said you wanted to go get your PhD. yeah that that was that was on the top of my list. I yep. thought, you know, you know, the hell with it. I'm 53. I'm up there, a little long in the tooth. I'm gonna go, you know, just get a PhD mm -hmm. and go out to pasture teaching kids, whatever. Yep. Um, but then I thought, you know. Um, I got to do this. Thing. I got to do this. Yep. This, is, this is the craziest thing. There you go. There you go. So you hashed this. How many people were in on the the idea of starting it? Um, two of us. Okay. And then did you have a list in your mind of willing accomplices that you thought you're like, I bet you I can get. I can swing them. I bet you I can convince somebody to, you know. Damn right I did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Damn right I had a so list. So who was your know. core team when you started? Um, how many how many did you have um so the so i so our very first employee there was this egg bot challenge in southern indiana and so two of us you know founded the company and there's this i'm at this egg bot challenge and there's this this this, this kid there who you know, I'm like, I've never seen a kid so excited. He was doing robotics and agriculture. And I just, you know what? I didn't even care. I, 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 I just looked at his, the excitement that this kid had. And I'm like, I'm going to hire, hire him. I wanted to hire Matt Climate, you know, because I'm like, this kid, this kid, I like, you know, he's just so excited. Yep. And, and I hired him. He was first, first kid. I pulled him out of, out of, uh, um, Purdue essentially. Okay. And then, uh, and then, you know, when, when I went out in 2019, then, you know, uh, I made a list of people and then, um, uh, Corey Spady, um, he's a Purdue guy. I worked at CNH Kubota. Um, I think he did a stint at deer as well. Um, Ravi and Deary, uh, front end, back end, full stack, incredible, you know, race horse software guy. And then I hired these two guys, Adam Gaynor, who Iridium, uh, yep. <laughs> Iridium child, yep. and uh, Aaron Petersdorf. Um, all these guys are, um, uh, you know, they're really remarkable, smart, um, versatile, industrious guys. Could yeah. you raise private money for it? Did you guys all pull together and get it started? Did you go out and look for investors to get it going? I, um, so initially, um, so I was the angel funder. Okay. So I funded it, Yep. you know, for the first, um, you know, six months. So I went out and I bought a planter. Never in my mind would I ever think that I bought a planter. Yep. Did you call your brother and say, Hey, guess look, what, I'm buddy? Back. I'm back, <laughs> back in business. I'm loading this thing up and ready. coming home. <laughs> I Get did. ready. I, I did. I, I, and I, you know, I told him, Dean, I have a, I have a larger planter than you. <laughs> <laughs> and then I uh, and then I leased a, a JCB tractor. I'm like, oh my god! Wow! And then believe it or not, I uh, I went and got a CDL. Someone's, go. nice. Someone's got to drive the. Yeah, semi. somebody's yeah. got to haul it around. Yeah, and go. I'm like, where am I going to find this guy? And I'm like, you know, I'm, well, hell, I'll just do it. Yeah. Right. And you know, and I went to some place in Des Moines and 24 hour CDL, and you know, there you go. Well, it took a little bit more than 24 hours, though. <laughs> sure. Um, but then, yeah, I had a list of these guys that I'm like, these, these, these guys are going to help me pull this off. Okay. Well, I feel like we might be getting a little bit ahead of ourselves because we had a conversation before we started and I watched where you were yesterday in North Dakota yeah. and you spoke a little bit about the why, because I guess if, for those that aren't familiar with what you're doing, what's the... Like, what is the why as far as where we are today in agriculture? And um, 
I I honestly I a little bit knew the demographics of America of ag, but I I I didn't know really. But you spoke pretty eloquently to that. Yeah. So you want me to repeat that? <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, kind of. What's what's the use case of autonomous farming? Why why are we going? Why do you want to go down that road? Oh, all right. So um, you know, and I I preface. I'll preface this again like I did yesterday. It's a very uncomfortable conversation. Sure. But I think it, it, it ha- we have to have it. Um, 3.4 million farmers in the United States. One third of them are over the age of 65. Okay. Per the CDC, they're going to live to be about 77. Yep. Right? So 12 years from now, one third of the farmers we all know are going to be gone. Yep. Now, what's equally... Frightening, frightening is um, another million of that 3.4 million, damn near one-third are between the ages of 55 and 65. I got like four good years, four good years, Sawyer. Yeah, you'll get that swivel koozie on the mower here pretty quick. <laughs> yeah. That's his thing he always tells me. He said, I, all the stuff we're doing now, <laughs> in about five, ten years, it's all going to be your responsibility, and all I want from you is just get a swivel koozie on the mower. So a nice mower, beer. nice mower, comfortable seat. And one of those really nice swivel koozies, and I'll just mow everything. And yeah, I don't exactly. think I don't think how that's gonna go though. He's pretty much a, he. Yeah. yeah, he's he says that, but I don't think that's gonna okay. I, we got off there. <laughs> so we've got a major. We've got a major. Well, nobody's addressing this, right? You know, and you know, and everyone's like, oh, you know, and what kills me is people. Oh, the average age hasn't changed much, but if you think about it. You know, when, you know, when, let's say a 65 year old person leaves and a 23 year old person comes in, yep. there's a hell of a lot of more years between, you know, um, right. 59, 59 is the average right. age between 23 and 59. Yeah. is a lot of years. Yeah. You're getting a, a few people in that are yeah. very young. Then that's what is keeping, that's what's keeping the, the average from moving a lot, but you're still headed to the cliff. Exactly. That's the, and you know, and I'm, I'm pretty good at math and, yeah. and I went through the, and it's about, uh, about two, for every two farmers that leave, one comes in. Yeah. And <laughs> who's going to do this work? Right. And, um, and then, you know, you talk to every farmer, you know, they're like labor's impossible, but you know, put that aside. <laughs> You know, yeah. who, who's, who, you know, and I talked to my brother, you know, he said, you know, if I, uh, you know, if I needed to hire a kid to shovel out his grain bin, he's like, I, I have no idea where, no I idea where to go. Yeah. No, he's like, nope. yeah, there's no kids like you and I. Uh, and then, you know, I, I would ask him well, 10 years from now, who's going to be farming your land? I have no idea. Yep. That's right. And he's like, you know. I'm like, all right, how many, how many people under the age of 35 can you name in, in Cherokee County? Right. Yeah, tough time. Yep. And, he, and, he, and I think he came down to 10. Yep. Okay. So uh, I don't know. What is there? Um, uh, um, there's like 500,000 acres in Cherokee County. Yeah. Okay, 10 people. Right. Okay. And, the th- and, and the thing is, is all 10 people can't manage 50,000 No. Acres. That's one of the big misconceptions. I hear that a lot, that technology is going to solve this because we're going to get more efficient and, the, and we're going to be able to cover more acres. But I, I personally know, I personally know some guys that are farming. They're farming 10,000 acres. Uh-huh. Okay, they can do it and they're, they're good at it. They don't want to farm 20,000. And I could not manage, I could not manage that operation. And there's a heck of a lot of people. I love farming. Yeah, I'd farm a thousand acres if I could find it, but I don't want to farm ten thousand acres. And so, out of that ten, maybe there's one that wants to be Big wants time. to harness every opportunity is out there, and he really wants to go. But and That's then there's one that enough. wants to farm a few. But you're not going to get. We're not going to get the people. Well, that yeah. can just can do it or that want to do it. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And the other thing is, you know, they're supposed to be what, 10 billion by 2050. So we, not only is there more, less labor, but we got to feed more people too. Right. That's the other thing. So 
Exactly. I mean, that really has nothing to do with labor because we're, we're just going to have Yeah, and it. something else that we didn't touch on, which to me is I look at this every day. So, you know, we're getting ready to go to harvest, and um, uh, I didn't get any wagons bought. For everybody that's been listening, I sold I sold. The Parker's all sold. I got to stop and pick up my big check, but um, I, I didn't get any wagons, any other wagons bought. I've got two Brent 657s and I was going to buy another one or two of them at an auction because a year ago there were all these wagons for sale. So I made the decision to sell my old crappy Parker wagons and I was like, yeah, I'll they'll be an auction. Them. I'll go get them. Uh, I bid on a couple up in Northern Iowa and I just happened to pick the auction where there's like three people that really wanted them and they brought three quarters of what a new one was and I couldn't bring myself to do it. So uh, I let I let David Zeezer know that I'm going to have to use his wagons. But anyway, um, machinery wise, so if the average for the average farmer out there, and you know, surprisingly, we're still average. I don't know how all that is, but so we literally farm 400 acres here, and for me to go buy, I hire my planning and harvesting done. We prepare, you know, we bring in the grain, we've got the wagons, we got the dryer, we got all that, and we get everything ready to go in the spring, but we basically no-till, and we we have that custom done. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing that Sawyer would like more than to have, you know, an 8335R with a 16-row planter and all that stuff and farm. You can't afford it. We can't make it work. It's too much money. The cost of The cost of equipment is insane slow well not even slowly it's it's geared towards that bigger operation it's not geared towards nobody wants to sell small scale equipment anymore Mm -hmm. and so your your barrier to entry just gets greater and greater so out of those 10 people that could be the farmers there's some of them that they they're just not going to be unless somebody is willing to just set them up which you know some of those guys may be willing to do that but it's a it's a big problem changes the game very good. That's a very good segue. <laughs> very good segue. <laughs> You've done this before. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, from where you started, yeah, you you've kind of where are you today? Where are where? It, what is the progression of Sabanto from where you started to where we're where we're at today? All right. So we started with uh, you know the the you know I'm not going to call it large, but it was fairly large. Um, 220 horsepower, 18 row. Um, you know, uh, we came back in uh, the spring of 2019 and uh, just started, to, uh, and then I hired the, I hired these guys. So, you know, we started looking at, you know, exactly autonomy and, and, and you know, I guess some of the things we learned. Um, the first thing I learned that if I require a CDL, then what I'm not doing is I'm, you know, every farmer complains labor. I got to have a guy with a CDL. Good luck finding that guy dependable, blah, blah, blah. And then I'm looking, I'm like, we can't have a CDL because what I'm doing is I'm not solving the problem. I'm just taking it over. Yep. And you know, these over the road truckers, they make pretty good money. Yep. And, you know, and I'm going to have to compete with that. And so, you know, the decision was made that every farmer owns a three quarter ton truck, three quarter ton trucks are, um, you know, they're very inexpensive, all things considered. And, uh, so we started looking at, it was at least basically, um, um, you know, we started looking at weights, 16,000 pounds, 4,000, 4,500 for the, uh, the trailer, it gives us 12,000. And then we started looking at you know, the Yanmar, the Kubota, the smaller tractors, deer, you know, everyone that made smaller tractor. And then, uh, you know, we were, you know, we said 60, 90 horsepower is, is we could haul that with, we thought a four or five row planter and it, and it was all, you know, just, you know, spreadsheets looking at solving the math problem. Yeah. And then it turned out that, you know, you know, when we came across Kubota, it was like, you know, you know, you could lease these for next to nothing. Yep. And I'm like, well, you know, why in the hell would we do that? Right. And uh, so that's that's what really drove us to using these smaller tractors. So these smaller tractors, what are you, what size of, what are you planting with? What kind of planter are you using? Uh, Harvest International. And four row, five row, um, six row? We do four row 30s and five row 20s. 
How many how many machines are you out running around the country with right now? Uh, eight. Eight right now. Well, ten. Okay. Right now. Yeah. For somebody that doesn't, it's not familiar with uh, anything as far as autonomous autonomous, autonomous uh, farming. Yeah. What What's the technology and and what do you need to make it work? How do you make it work? When if I call you and say I got an eighty acre field and mm-hmm. and you want to come do it, what's involved in doing that? Okay. The first thing we do is when we show up to a field. Um, we strike the boundary. So we, we, we take the tractor and just drive the boundary. Geofence it. Geofence it. And, uh, and we do that because um, we have rules, and it's just uh, out of things we have learned. Number one, never trust the field boundary from a farmer. <laughs> That's, <laughs> That's a, a good, good plan. <laughs> That's a good yeah. plan. <laughs> yeah. No matter. And you know what? Uh, we got burned a couple times, and it was because, oh, no, trust me, these are the boundaries. <laughs> the and third like, post past <laughs> the whatever. Yeah, and it's like, oh, my God. And then it just turns into a nightmare, you know, continuing. Um, <laughs> no river bottoms, too. Um, <laughs> uh, we get burned every time we make it. Yeah, something that's there that wasn't supposed to be there. Yeah, and then, you know, oh, it's, you know, there's no trash on this ground. Oh, yeah. it just flooded. Now there's trash. Yeah. And then there's saplings. God. Yeah, so, I mean, there is, there is, um, there is limits to what, what you can do. Yeah. From that, from that perspective. Yeah, and the other thing, too, is that it takes, it, t- it takes a little discipline, um, to say no. Sure. You know, um, there are some fields that are probably in the short term are not well suited for autonomy mm-hmm. and you just have to say no. Right. You know, I would love to, but I can't at this point in time. The equipment that you're using, the software you're doing, somebody that is, so our, like our fields are mapped um, mm-hmm. as far as um, when we plan them, we're using, we're using uh, precision, precision planning um, so software. We. So do we. Um, so in that situation, you can load those maps into your into what you're doing. Yeah, um, we're completely cloud based. So, um, all right. So we are using precision planting planters, okay. seed meters, and downforce. Yep. Um, and we're we're doing prescriptions. This last spring, we did prescription wow. planting but it's all up into the cloud. Okay. So, and we communicate back down to the tractor, the prescription. So there's no jumping on and, and loading it on a 2020. We're running without a 2020. Yeah. Well, there's no need for it cause nobody needs to look at it. Yeah. <laughs> there's yeah. nobody riding around to look at it. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Wow. My engineers, what they do is they monitor or they can remotely. Yeah, they control seating rate and they monitor. And, and if there's a, a difference, a significant difference in population, then we, we pause the tractor. Yeah, to figure out what's going on. Yeah, we, we uh, look at the margins on downforce and adjust accordingly and whatnot. So we wrote algorithms that did that. My question is, is like, how does this business, how does this business model work? So are you guys like going to farmers and saying, <laughs> hey, you know, do you want to try this out? Or are you guys coming to their farm? They're like, I want to see how this works. And like, how, do, how, what is, is it? The ultimate goal is to get farmers to take on what you're doing. Or right now, are you just doing research to figure out, get it down to a science before you go out and sell it to farmers? Like what's, what's the whole break, break that down for me, okay. if you would. So right now we have very progressive farmers that we're working with that have obviously labor problems mm-hmm. and, um, so what we're doing is we're taking over acres from them. Mm-hmm. They're you know, paying you to plant for They're them. paying, yeah, they're paying. Or whatever you're doing. Yeah. And like, uh, for instance, this last, this last spring, we took over a thousand acres over from a, a farmer in Nebraska. And we roto-tilled. That was his primary yep. tillage. We roto-tilled a thousand acres. Wow. With one little tractor. How, how, fast, how fast did it do that? Um, you know, it took about two and a half weeks. Mm-hmm. But, you know... No skin off my back. I right. Was, I was right. sitting on it. Yeah, right. You know, right. And the little thing just ran all night long and yeah. all day long and all night long. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Just, you, know, you throw it in 480 f- acre field and it takes a while, but, mm-hmm. you know, we have time on our side. Right. Then we uh, planted uh, and then we uh, turned around and, um, well, we field cultivated, then planted, then tine weeded, 
uh, rotary hold, um, Colvate, Colvate, Colvate. So you do exactly how they would do it mm-hmm. themselves. You can, they kind of come to you and then they're like, this is how I do it. And then you guys do exactly what they would do just autonomously. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Mm-hmm. So you're just a cust. you're kind of just doing custom I, farming. Right yeah. Now. Yeah. Yeah. You know, with the mindset that long term, you know, he's going to he's going to be operating these. And, you you know, what's kind of interesting, what we're doing is um, and and why we're doing this contracting farming as a service. The onus is on us. Mm -hmm. And sure. And, you know, when you know, when, you know, if you can imagine that, you know, like when we went out in the spring of 2020, I took all my engineers and they were sitting in the field and you know, if we have path plan problems, you know, it's going to be a late night until you get this fixed. Yeah. You know, it's not, well, I'll start on it on Monday. Right. No, it's like everyone's out there. They're experiencing what it's like to be the farmer there because it's got to get going now. Exactly. Because you've got that window. Exactly. And you know, I, I've, I've been an engineer for what, 30, 30 plus years. And, um, you know, peer pressure is kind of a good thing. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Back up yep. against a wall, you just gotta figure yeah, it out. Yeah, you gotta figure it out, yeah. and and you know, everyone's there to help. You know, help you. You know, get. You know, if like, you know, we had all sorts of issues. I'm not saying that. You know, everything went. On, you know, came off, but, but that's how you learn. Mm-hmm. It's exactly how you learn. Yeah, and so as you do this, as you do more acres, you're collecting the data as far as everything, every, every. Uh, what what do we call that? Uh, every edge situation that you come up that is out of the norm, and you're using that to make the system better. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and it, it, what was interesting is, you know, when I was at John Deere, um, you know, most everyone came from a farm there. Yep. I mean, a lot. There were a lot of farm kids. Yep. And there were a lot of guys that uh, farmed on the side. Yep. Right. They still farmed yep. and, or they wanted to be farmers. And then when I went to Tremont working with precision, yep. they weren't under climate. Um, you know, all those guys there farmed yep. for the most part. And I, and there's an advantage to that. Yes. Mm-hmm. And yes. you know, and yeah, you can learn and whatnot, but you know, they don't teach you that, you know, be careful of the shovel. These, yeah. You know, the nuances, the, the nuances. stuff that you grew up and you just take for granted when you bring somebody that, has no yep. idea. It's yeah, and and you know I, I thought that was important. You know, uh, an important culture in the company. Yeah, f- to you know to have you know experience that, and you know if you look at my software guys, they all know how to chain down a load. Mm-hmm. That's you good. know because I make them do it. Right, I'm like you know, hey, jump in, help. Yep, and you know, and they're very industrious guys. And uh, I wanted to make sure that that culture that you know nothing is beneath you. Sure. Yeah. That. Yeah. That's that's a good that's a good way to be. Do you find that that's a? Do you find that those guys that don't know is that a good kind of like outside the norm having guys that aren't at, like in agriculture grew up in agriculture they kind of bring some different perspectives. You know, people always say it's not always good to have people that have just been consumed by one industry. It's good to have eyes from other industries. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I do. So, you know, and I'll, I'll speak on my behalf. Um, I spent, you know, again, you know, 20 plus years in the wireless industry. So I used to go into these manufacturing plants and I used to. So, you know, the rule of thumb, just like $1,000 per horsepower in, in the wireless industry, um, the cellular industry specifically, it's a million dollars per second per line per year. So you go into Foxconn where they make Apple yep. or or Nokia in in in, in uh, um, Beijing. Um, if you could save a second from test time, then you could save a million a million dollars per line, and and it and it all comes down to statistics. It, seriously, you you look at you know if you're measuring something, believe it or not, you can make a faster measurement and degrade the measurement to the point where it's good enough. Yes. Around here we call that an Amish carpenter. <laughs> <laughs> they only use they only use the big numbers on the on the uh, tape measure, but they're fast. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard that term. Is that a Lawrence? Uh? Uh, w- so a lot of these hog buildings that, that we, the company I used to work for, and it 
they use Amish carpenters and we always kind of bagged on those guys a little bit that they oh, only yeah. used they only used well, any time that we would find something that they didn't have quite right or a wall that was crooked it's like you guys got to stop using just the big numbers you know you got to <laughs> learn them little bits crap, in between man. and they get oh, pissed yeah. at us but so i guess the one thing i learned um specifically at national instruments was um measuring things quantitatively versus qualitatively and and I, I think some of that, um, you know, is being you is followed in our company today, like, you know, our navigation accuracy. You know, um, Aaron, one of my engineers. I mean, he's he's all over that, and and he, you know, if you ask him, hey, what's our he once, over it? Yeah, what's our what's our one sigma? Um, you know, we're running right now with this uh, fifty six sixty pulling this, uh, you know, planter and he'll. He'll know it. He'll know it right off the bat. Yep. And would guys at John Deere and Precision probably not know that kind of stuff? Like, do you think they'd be as good as that guy? You know, I, <laughs> I'm not going <laughs> to. Boy, die. you're kind of baity, well, aren't you? I yeah, know, yeah. He's just, uh, he's putting <laughs> Turn of the no, knife. You know what, though? Uh, all right. Here's what I will say that kind of amazed me when I when I came into agriculture. Um, You know, when, when you buy a planter, for example, no, let, 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 let me let me start with if you go buy a DMM, a digital multimeter, right? Yep. Go buy a fluke. All right. There's a specifications associated with it. And you look at that specifications, it'll tell you over what temperature range, how accurate, what's the integral nonlinearity, what's the differential nonlinearity, what's the accuracy, what's the gain offset. They, they I mean, it is down I mean, you understand, and this is a you know, um, you know, two, three hundred dollar digital multimeter. They know exactly how it's going to react exactly. to any environment. Yeah. But you go buy a planter and this is everyone and this is everyone in agriculture and it goes beyond just, you know, it, like I'm surprised on planters that that um, seed spacing variability. What is it? One inch? Mm -hmm. Is it two inches? They don't know. They don't know. Yeah. Now, and, and they'll all get, you know, all, it's all dependent upon the ground. Right. You know, but. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> is right. it? Because the ground's fairly. But, but, I mean, I mean, it's, it's kind of amazing to me that you go out and you spend $350,000 for a planter and you don't even know what its accuracy is. Yeah. Right. Yep. And, and, you know, and I will say that, you know, you know, do it on sand. Right. Right. Do it. I mean, you know. You know, the D, I'll go back to the DMM. They'll tell you what accuracy at 95% humidity rate. Yep. Right? Yep. And, but, you know, there's there's kind of a lack of that in agriculture. Yeah. You, you know, and I'll give the example. Don't you find it odd that University of Nebraska has a tractor test lab? Yes. I mean, why why is the third party doing this? Yeah. You know, and... and and I'm not going to dog on, you know, it's maybe, maybe I'm missing something in the industry and I'm sure people comment on. Yeah. Well, that's all right. Yeah. We love the comments. We don't read them sometimes if they look nasty. <laughs> I only, I only read the first few words and if they um, say anything yeah, mean about yeah. Tor. Yeah. Cause I get triggered easily. <laughs> Soft. Yeah. What's the few, what's the few, where is it going? What's the future for Sabanto? And what do you feel like? What, where are we headed? My goals of the future is to um, keep deploying autonomy in agriculture. We're going to be working working with farming operations. And we're also going to enable people, um, younger people, to. Um, I want to see a first generation farmer. Yeah, that's a good goal to have. Are you thinking that you're going to get to the point where you're offering that system that somebody buys the system from you, either has you install it or it's it's to the point where they can install it themselves on an, any model of tractor, not obviously or you, small tractor. Are you looking at it more that you're going to continue to build out your fleet to where you'll be a sizable custom farming operation? I'm going to enable um, other people to retrofit yeah. a tractor. Nice. Yeah, I like that. We like that. I do yeah. like that. <laughs> And it might be, <laughs> it might be model uh, uh, or specific. Specific, mm -hmm. yeah, depending on who yeah. will work with you. Yeah, and I have, yeah. I'm getting inundated with people that want to do that. When I talk to people, I'm I'm kind of excited about what you're doing, 
And I think what, it's different. It's I'm not, you know, I'm not coming out and making a, you know, uh, I'm I'm somewhat outside of the you know, norm. To, the norm. The norm. Yeah, yeah. I'm abnormal. Call that. <laughs> but a common reaction I get when I explain to people that that what Sabanto is doing and using the the smaller horsepower tractors, <laughs> I've gotten this from more than one per more than one person. They've said. Well, I'm surprised somebody from Deer or fill in the blank. I'm surprised that fill in major equipment manufacturer. I'm surprised somebody hasn't killed him yet, <laughs> because <laughs> because you you're changing you're the changing game. the paradigm. Uh, I totally I feel like you're changing. Yeah, disruption is the thing. Mm-hmm. And we touched on this. I think we touched on this when you and I were talking before we started. Sometimes the best conversation we need to start the camera right when somebody gets here because we have some good conversation <laughs> yeah, before we ever get started. I did say off the camera. Oh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's true. But this one, I think I don't, I don't think you have a problem with this. Um, I feel like that in ag today, the mainstream is that we are going to continue to build bigger and bigger equipment using autonomy as far as we're going to sink the tractor to the grain cart so that we can put anybody in the seat or maybe we get to the point where we don't need somebody in the seat but the the cost of entry is still huge and we're on this plane of bigger is more efficient bigger is more efficient and i i feel like what you're doing is challenging that in in saying totally well, bigger isn't necessarily more efficient, and bigger is not necessarily going to solve this the problem that problem. Yeah, we this got. problem we have. Okay, uh, and my answer to that is, I could care less about efficiency and cost and whatnot. Uh, my goal is, you go to let's say Washington, right? Yep, right yep. next door here. I know you know probably four or five guys, Sawyer's age, yep. who are industrious. They want a farm. Yep. And for one reason or another, they want to live in Washington. Yep. That's where all their family is, you know, their high school sweetheart. They, I mean, this is where they want to live. It's a social media hub. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. And, um, um, you know, he, he wants to farm. Yep. But he didn't win the ovarian lottery. Yep. And, uh, you know, the day that some 20-year-old, um, is going out and uh, farming. Yep. Autonomously. That's a good day. It's a good day. Yep. That's a good goal. That's a good goal to have. Yeah. Hey, I'm willing to be your test dummy if you need somebody. Okay. Just saying. Okay. Well, see, <laughs> see I have selfish goals. I want. I. I like when I see it. I want to be able to just call, call Gary Stout, call my neighbor, my one of my best childhood friends that farms not very far from me. I want to be able to call him when I know that he's out planting. And be like, hey, how's it going? And, oh, good, you know, we're trying to finish this up. What are you doing? Oh, we're going to Roadhouse. Oh, well, yeah, are you done? Oh, no, I just got I just got my iPad. I'm planting right now. You know, what are you doing? Yeah. You want to come with? Oh, yeah, that's right. You can't get out of the tractor. Uh, mic drop. <laughs> yeah, when you, you know, seriously, I've waited bed at 1130 at night and pull up my phone, and I'm watching this little tractor. That's yep. super cool. Out in the field toiling yep all night long and i fall asleep you wake up at six and still going you didn't get any alarm that anything went wrong yeah i had one question so we're we're on the tilling and planning side of it what Mm -hmm. do you think do you think we could apply the same you know small not big to the harvest side of it because everyone always everyone always says that we say that you know you i think you can do small tractors for those planting and tilling but when it comes to harvest you still need that big old grain great big combine you need the grain cart you need the semi and you need a, a big enough tractor with enough horsepower to haul that heavy ass grain cart so do you think autonomous t- autonomous farming will go to that side of it last or do you think it ever gets there or do you think you know you always have to have big machinery um you know doing that side of it i, I kind of threw a lot at you there but yeah, you did. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, you know, we haven't addressed harvest at this mm-hmm. point in time, um, but we've talked about it yep. quite a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, we do have some plans. I think. I think um, continuing. I think it'll 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 come down in cost. Yep. As well. 
Um, I think there's, um, you know, if you look at autonomy, you bring that tool into the harvest um, field operation, I think certain things change. Just just like tillage, right? Um, you know, you know the size comes down because of autonomy. Yeah. And I think uh, the size will come down because of autonomy and, and harvest as well. And I think the other thing too is, you know, <clears throat> sustainability and compaction. Yep. Mm-hmm. I mean, that is starting to get a lot of uh, a lot of uh, traction, traction, and focus yep. right now. Mm-hmm. And I think that you know the grain cart's one of the worst mm-hmm. offenders of that. Yep. Right. And and I think. Uh, you know, I think autonomy is could really change that. Could really change that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's one of the that's one of the big advantages I see of the even on even at scale, guys that are farming a lot. The swarm idea, where you would have several of those smaller implements, mm-hmm. as far as soil health, I think that's a that's uh, going to be big going forward right. as we get. And further. that might have to be the selling point that you really sell to farmers, because he said, you know, most guys are going to be like, eh, no, I'm not going to do that, but. Well, younger guys, you can get like me, but if you're trying to get an older guy, maybe yeah. you could sell well, them. You know on what's that point what's interesting though? Whenever whenever I talk to farmers, it's not the combine or the grain cart; it's the trucking. Yeah, mm-hmm. they're they're like we're always behind yep. on trucks. Yep. So, I mean, when you talk a harvest, I think you know how how can you you know get rid basically get rid of the truckers. Yep. And, you know, I see the bags and maybe local, you know, have a more local uh, uh, um, or the mother of all bins. There's there's various ways or ideas out there that I think. Tesla semi. <laughs> Take that thing right straight to the straight to the feed mill. Just send her out there. Yeah. Um, what's the what, this is a little lighthearted, but I was just thinking as you have as you have deployed these systems out i mean you've been out to nebraska all Mm. through iowa illinois yeah what's the what's the reaction yeah what are some of the what's the craziest reaction you've gotten from somebody like have you literally had people that stop by thinking that something something has gone amiss all the time (laughs) i just figured no there's people that stop their cars and they get out and you know they stare um it happens all the time. Yeah. All the time. Um, you know, probably every 15 minutes. Um, uh, we've been visited by the police twice. Really? Yes. Wow. 911 calls. Some they probably figured the farmer <laughs> fell, fell off, the, off tractor. the tractor. Farmer fell off the tractor. Yep. And, um, you know, one funny, uh, Corey and I were out in a field one time, and about a half mile away, we see a pickup. And... Uh, we're like, ah, oh, there's, there's another, uh, you know, Docker. spectator. That's what we call them. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Corey's like, oh, that's an equipment truck. That's, that's some company. So, you know, after about 20 minutes, we go over there and it's an equipment dealers always come by. Yep. And, he, and this, it, 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 I won't name the company, but he, he comes around, he says, well, guys, you caught me. I was just snooping and, you know, he's taking pictures, but it just so happened he had, um, um, he had a flat tire because he was on one of those maintenance roads. Sure. And he had flat tires. So, and he was a little long in the tooth. So Corey and I yeah. will change your tire or whatever. But when we got done, I said, Hey, Hey Corey, you think we should charge him a hundred bucks for a field call? <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. I didn't find that so funny, but, um, that was a good time. Yeah. People stop by all the time. I guess I should ask first, are you at the point where you are, wanting to market this to people that want to install the system on their own equipment. Are you there yet? I'm not there at this point in time. Okay. Next year I will. When you get to that point, do you have any feel as far as what the rate of adoption, like how much demand do you think is out there for what, what you're thinking of doing or what you're working towards doing? You know, I think there's a lot of demand out there. Yeah, I do too. If I if I look at, uh, I mean, we're inundated with uh, people that, uh, you know, yeah, calling you, calling us. Yeah, I guess the size of tractor probably doesn't make that much difference on the on the the size of your system, does it? No, I mean we're we're on you know right now uh, we're on uh, 180 down to uh, 60. So it's probably more about the size of implement you're going to run. 
It is. Than it is the tractor that it's mounted on. It is. But if you're a, so if you're a guy that, um, you're going to do a six, you've got a six or you got six row equipment. Um, what kind of a, I don't know. I might be putting you on the spot. Like, what do you envision the price point to get a system on a hundred horse tractor that could pull a six row planter? That's yet to be determined. Okay. That's what, that's good. But I guarantee it's going to be cost effective. Yeah. Because the 20 year old. Right. It has to be at a point where they can make it. Yeah. Well, this 50 year old ain't got any money because I got a couple of 20 year olds. Yeah. They bleed me dry. <laughs> I know how that goes. It's terrible. What has been your biggest challenge with starting this company? What has been the hardest thing? Was it getting the tractors? Because I know you touched on that a little bit. You figured that out with the Kubotas and getting the leases. But what has been the hardest part of it all? You know, <laughs> that's really hard. All of it. There's so kind many. of a problem. So many. Ask right. me tomorrow. You know, you know uh, um, so every farmer can, uh, can probably relate to this. Um, when, when you go out in the field and we're going to plant, we're going to till, we're going to do something, and, you know, the entire world is crapping on you, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. I mean, and imagine, you know, we got the front end, we got the back end, we got the equipment, we got the, you know, the navigation, we got the drivers, we got everything, you know, that all has to work. And you go out there, especially in the spring of 2020, and I'll be the first to say that, you know, there were times where we got our butt handed to us. Right, right. Right. Mm -hmm. And you're under a microscope. We're under a microscope and, you know, and, you know, we had just gotten funded and we're out there and, you know, the investors, the farmers, the, you know. Spectators. Yeah, spectators. (laughs) And, you know, it's, and, and then you realize logistics, you know, and, and, and you guys know that, you yeah. know, when you're going out and, and, you know, making logistics, making sure, you know, you know, that planter has to be moving. Why isn't it moving? Right. Well, you know, you know, it they don't care. Communications issues, yeah. you know, it's, you know, and, you know, and then, you know, and then I, I always give the example. I woke up one time and not, not many of the guys knew this, but I woke up. You know, we went to bed at midnight. I woke up at three o'clock. I'm like, what in the hell am I doing? Yep. I mean, what did I get myself into? I mean, is this doable? And I, I you know, and I, I laid in bed till six o'clock. You yeah. Know? Angston. Okay. Yeah. And get up in the morning, put a smile on your face. Come on, guys. You know, yep. mm-hmm. but then, you know, um, you know, the, the logic portion of me says, okay, we, we have communication problems. This is a solvable problem. Right, it's the tyranny of the urgent that got us into this situation. Yep. Right, we didn't test it enough, and then navigation, solvable problem, and and I'm just going through. There's nothing unsolvable here, yeah. and and that and you know it's it's, um, you know yet you, you really have to um, you know keep everything in check and keep your emotions in check. Yep. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes you want to throw the wrench and, yep. and scream at the top of your lungs, but, you know, it's a solvable problem. Yep. Mm-hmm. You know, so, and this is what you said re- reminded me of this, but something has started happening, or I, maybe it's always been this way, but I find it, I always find it interesting that when you're dealing with new technologies, People and media, especially, they want to put, they enjoy putting human quality, human qualities on inanimate objects. So the ex- example I always like to look at is when, when my wife's Toyota, if my wife has an accident, if she had an accident with our car, it would, the, the, the local paper would write that um, forty-eight year old woman, year old woman was involved in a car accident at the ja- junction of one and ninety-two. If my wife was driving a Tesla Model S, it would read, "Model S crashes <laughs> crashes into fill in the blank at junction one and two. Like it, like it willed itself. Right. Or you know the stories where those people there was there was an accident in Texas and two men died and. 
they there was a debate about whether uh full self driving was on and it's like autopilot Tesla kills two men. Yeah. Well, it's the same thing as like you're talking about when you're trying to disrupt something. Yeah, when you're trying to disrupt something, the technology Everyone's it takes different. on a life of its lo- of its own, and people like hold it to a human standard when it's 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 not. It's it's all the things that go into it, and it's a process. And we expect. And it's so funny because we've been we've been you know new technology's just been coming out for you know for as long as we yeah. can remember. You know, as humans, that's part of being who we are. And I feel like everything that's new that comes out, people just shit on it. They shit on it until it, it, <laughs> it, until it's perfect, until it's and then perfect. they can't live without. It. Right. Yeah. You, know, you know. Let me give you an example. Um, we were up in Minnesota near Mankato, and we're planting. And it was for Crystal Valley Co-op. There was twenty, thirty farmers there, right? And oh my God, you know, the, you know, the, the hardware decided to take a shit on us. Yeah. Right. And we had a cold solder joints on these one modules. We soon, you know, after the fact learned, but it was intermittent. Yep. And the thing, and, and the engineers were totally freaking out. Yep. Right. And, and I gave them the mindset of, and, and what I did was I said, okay, come with me. Went to the 30 farmers and just sat there and said, you think this is easy? It's not. Yep. Okay. Yep. There are about 30, 40 plates that we have to keep spinning, and one isn't, okay? And this is what's going on. So it's going to take, don't stand around wondering, you know, what the hell's going on, you know, these guys, you know, it is, you know, I have no qualms about walking up to a group of farmers um, and telling them that, you know, this, this is, this is actually hard, and no one's ever done this before, and that's why you're out here. Yep. Yeah, and I, there's probably a, that's probably one of the better groups of people that you could have that conversation right. with. Oh hell yeah, because, because they understand. Farm, oh god, yeah. yeah. They every understand. Farmer, yeah, yeah, they're like I, then they tell their war stories and I'm yep, like, <laughs> yep. This that doesn't compare, buddy, with things. Oh, that's nothing. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I you know, this is something I never really thought about, but we had Jason Agley on here and he's a he's a farmer in southeast Iowa, but he does a lot with solar. He's got a company that does solar. And he also used to be involved in um, the biodiesel business. Yeah. And he actually did some money raising out on the East Coast when he was involved in getting a biodiesel plant going. And he said that farmers are, the, are just an absolute rarity because when you go outside of agriculture and you find a banker, a banker is a banker is a banker. All he knows is banking. That's what he's done. And when you find an accountant, he's an accountant and an accountant and an accountant. But when you're talking to a farmer, there isn't a group of people that you can have more varied conversations with than a farmer because they're a mechanic, they're an engineer, they're an accountant, they're a manager, they're a meteorologist. They're all these things because they have to be because they can't get anybody to do it or they're not willing to pay they're not willing to pay <laughs> they're not willing to pay so they figured out themselves Maybe the research should do and, it I, and it's true and so like in that situation you know there's certain groups of people that if you were explaining a new technology they would they would be pissed yeah they'd be pissed but i figured that those farmers would be like yep yeah, that's nothing yep yeah, yep yeah, i've been there <laughs> oh, they're exactly you're right. exactly right yeah, yeah they are it's amazing all trades so what's been harder starting Sabota? Or um, well, wrestling wild boars. No, uh, I'm probably starting starting Sabanto. Sabanto, sorry, yeah, the yeah. boar submitted. Someday Sabanto probably submitted. doesn't submit. Yeah, there was. <laughs> there's a funny backstory about that, but I I don't think I should get into that. <laughs> That's okay. That's all right. Well, um, I really appreciate you coming on, and I think we should, if you would be able. When we get ready to post this, if if my technical guy, I'd love to post a little clip of a of a tractor running with. Can we embed that in the video? Because there's yeah. probably a lot of people that are going to listen and see and watch this that maybe have not seen the the tractors run. Yeah. And we'll put a we'll we put a little snippet in there, and we'll put a link to your website. Yeah, in the okay. in if the you description. Send us that stuff over. Yeah, if you guys want to check out their website, you know, you got Twitter and LinkedIn and yeah. Yeah, check out all their social media. We'll have it down below so you can kind of see their videos and see what they're all about. But yeah, Craig, it's been a pleasure. 
So that's been great. It's, it's been really good. Uh, this is everything we like to talk about. Yeah, and and um, we love disruption around here. And you know what? Come back anytime. Um, as you get this thing, as you get this thing, uh, whatever the next step is, keep us keep us in the loop. I'll keep up on it. I watch pretty. I watch pretty hard. But I'll be your yeah. test dummy. I'll be your test dummy. Twenty year old a year. Wanting okay. to get get going. All right. Just letting you know. <laughs> all right. See. <laughs> See. Yeah. <laughs> they're they're Point all proven. No, they are. They are. They are. Yeah. And it's you know, and they just need an opportunity. Yeah. Right. And. Right. It, and I, I want to see a first generation farmer. I just wanted to say you're so right in the fact that I feel like this generation, um, the beautiful thing about them is nobody really puts them in a box and they don't accept my generation. We grew up and we accepted everything that was, was put to us as be like, Oh yeah. That, yeah. That sounds right. I think that's right. Everything and, we were told. Yeah. Whatever we were told, we we're like, yeah. And, you know, uh, we watched the evening news at 530 back when when you only had an hour of news every day, yeah. uh, the good old days. But um, this generation, because of a lot of, I think, maybe not not positive um, things within society, but I think a positive reaction is they don't accept anything at face value and they want to do they want to find out for themselves. And if you tell them no, they're going to find out eight reasons why they can do it. Yeah. And I think that's, I think that's, that gives me a lot of hope Yeah, I because I, I feel like um, a lot of things that need to get figured out. There's some big problems out there and there's a lot of things to figure out, but I think we got a generation coming that they'll figure them out. They will. So, and I might get my swivel koozie yet. <laughs> You'll get it. I'm, I'm certain you'll get it. <laughs> All right, Craig. Thanks. Thank thanks you for, so much for being on. Yeah. Thanks for coming on Barn Talk. It was a pleasure. It was great. It was great being here. Uh-huh.